Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Woodward Incorporated Second Quarter Fiscal Year 2024 Earnings Call. At this time, I would like to inform you that this call is being recorded for rebroadcast and that all participants are in a listen-only mode. Following the presentation, you are invited to participate in a question and answer session. Joining us today from the company are Chip Blankenship, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Bill Lacey, Chief Financial Officer, and Dan Provaznik, Director of Investor Relations. I would now like to turn the call over to Dan Provaznik. Thank you, Operator. We'd like to welcome all of you to Woodward's second quarter fiscal year 2024 earnings call. In today's call, Chip will comment on our strategies and related markets. Bill will then discuss our financial results as outlined in our earnings release. At the end of the presentation, we will take questions. For those who have not seen today's earnings release, you can find it on our website at woodward.com. We have again included some presentation materials to go along with today's call that are also accessible on our website. An audio replay of this call will be available by phone or on our website through May 13, 2024. The phone number for the audio replay is on the press release announcing this call, as well as on our website, and will be repeated by the operator at the end of the call. I would like to refer to and highlight our cautionary statement as shown on slide two. As always, elements of this presentation are forward-looking or based on current outlook and assumptions for the global economy and our businesses more specifically. Those elements can and do frequently change. Our forward-looking statements are subject to a number of risks and uncertainties surrounding those elements, including the risks we identify in our filings with the SEC. These statements are made as of today, and we do not intend to update them except as required by law. In addition, Woodward is providing certain non-U.S. GAAP financial measures. We direct your attention to the reconciliations of non-U.S. GAAP financial measures, which are included in today's slide presentation and our earnings release and related schedules. We believe this additional financial information will help in understanding our results. Now, I will turn the call over to Chip. Thanks, Dan. Today, prior to my commentary on our company's financial performance, I want to start with safety, which is how we normally begin our operating meetings. In our industry, we must wake up every day thinking about safety and how to sharpen our safety culture. While Woodward has a strong, even world-class safety record, there's always room to improve. As I've shared previously, we prioritize our work in the order of safety, quality, delivery, and cost. Delivery and cost are incredibly important, but we stop our work if there's an unsafe condition. And it is not acceptable to pass along a defect to meet a product delivery goal. This disciplined order of battle is ingrained in our operational culture. At the same time, as we aspire to zero safety incidents due to the existence of layers of protection and zero quality escapes due to a thorough understanding of built-in quality at the source, we know there are opportunities to improve. One way we are enhancing the safety culture at Woodward is through the rollout of human and organizational performance, also known as HOP, an approach that builds an engaged proactive workforce focused on preventing errors and providing for fail-safe outcomes. Key tenets of HOP are that the absence of a significant event and low injury rates do not mean a company has a robust safety program. In my prior experience leading HOP implementations and seeing them in action, I know it's a game-changing system. As a simple example of HOP in action, a few years ago, I visited an aluminum rolling mill facility with a mature hop system in place and was told that my visit was the high-risk task of the day for the site. Not because I'm inherently dangerous, I hope, but because my presence was a distraction and represented a significant interruption to the normal work patterns. It's partly this keen awareness of human interaction with the environment that makes this system so effective and why we've chosen to implement it at Woodward. Last week, 
during a management and board visit to our Glotten facility in Germany. I asked the value stream leader in the pump fuel assembly area what the high-risk task of the day was. Without leading the witness, he said this tour. I was pleased with our progress. Following a successful launch of HOP at our rock cut plant last year, we're making progress across our other sites and have accelerated certain aspects of the system to all plants this year, including fatality and serious injury prevention assessments and gap closure projects. The fatality and serious injury approach, FSI for short, focuses on key risks inherent to manufacturing, assembly, and test operations. In pursuit of excellence, Woodward has aggressive targets to reduce quality escapes to customers. Our commitment to quality is essential to support OEMs and their customers' own goals for safe and reliable operation. As an error reduction methodology, HOP provides tools to help members reduce errors that could impact delivered quality. This is not just a quality function responsibility, it's everyone's job. We have conducted quality stand downs to support members and to emphasize our dedication to getting it right. Additionally, we have embarked upon enhanced rigorous training in areas such as quality management systems, metrology, problem solving, and HOP. I'm pleased to see how members embrace these methodologies in their daily work. And we want to continue building a culture where they feel empowered to raise issues and help resolve them. Next, I'd like to provide a brief update on strategic planning. We recently performed a deep dive into the R&D and CapEx investments necessary to meet near-term financial commitments, prepare for the next single-aisle aircraft program, and prepare for our critical role in the energy transition. My leadership team and I spent time studying innovation roadmaps with our aerospace and industrial businesses and technology teams, and with our nine Woodward Innovation Network teams who work on breakthrough technologies, in some cases leveraging innovation breakthroughs across our two business segments. I'm pleased with our progress on optimizing both the focus and the breadth of our R&D portfolio to ensure Woodward's competitiveness and unique value proposition to our customers' future products. On the CapEx front, we continue to explore additional automation investment opportunities with strong calculated returns inside the planning horizon. Moving forward in these calls, I'll continue to touch on topics like these related to our interconnected value drivers of growth, operational excellence, and innovation, and I hope you'll find them interesting. Turning to our results, we delivered significant sales growth and margin expansion year over year across both our aerospace and industrial businesses. The compounding impacts from our focused efforts on operational excellence are enabling us to capitalize on continued strong end market demand. While there is still more work to do, I am proud of our team's efforts and dedication. Moving to our markets, in aerospace, we continue to see strong commercial airline, domestic, and international passenger traffic, resulting in high aircraft utilization. Transatlantic traffic remains strong. Further increases in aircraft utilization are expected as international passenger traffic in Asia Pacific continues to recover. While the overall macro environment remains strong, we are monitoring OEM build rate dynamics and modeling potential impacts on our business so we can actively manage these risks. In defense, recent escalation in geopolitical tensions is driving increased demand as U.S. and foreign militaries look to replenish inventories. The amount of government R&D proposals and procurement dollars available are rising, and suppliers are ramping up to meet this demand. In industrial, Rising global power demand is driving increased investment in gas-fired power generation for both prime and backup power, which is attributed to global development primarily in Asia. Data center demand for backup power, which is primarily diesel-fueled reciprocating engines, appears to be growing sharply, and the outlook for capacity firming applications supporting renewable energy and grid stability remains optimistic. In transportation, the global marine market remains healthy, 
tasked with elevated ship build rates driving OEM engine demand and high utilization rates fueling current and future aftermarket activity. Demand for alternative fuels across the marine industry continues to increase. Demand for natural gas heavy-duty trucks in China has been strong. While the mix of heavy-duty truck production in China has been trending towards natural gas engines, recent discussions with our customers indicate there may be a softening in demand this summer and potentially a return to the stronger demand towards the fourth quarter of calendar 2024. We continue to monitor the economic environment and the durability of this demand and remain in close contact with our customers in China. Regarding oil and gas markets, uncertainty in the United States for LNG exports continues as application reviews remain on pause, although global demand outside of the United States remains strong. Positive sentiment in the space is driven by strong performance and outlook in domestic shale oil, as well as refining and petrochemical activities in China and India. In summary, ongoing market trends indicate strong and sustained demand. Our second quarter performance reflects the hard work and dedication of Woodward members and the progress we've made to strengthen our value proposition and fulfill our purpose. We believe we are well positioned to capitalize on current and future opportunities, and we remain focused on driving profitable growth, operational excellence, and innovation to enhance shareholder value. I'll now turn it over to Bill to share our financial results. Thank you, Chip, and good afternoon to everyone. As a reminder, all comparisons are year-over-year year unless otherwise stated. Net sales for the second quarter of fiscal 2024 were a record $835 million, an increase of 16%. Earnings per share and adjusted earnings per share for the second quarter of fiscal 2024 were $1.56 and $1.62, respectively, compared to earnings per share and adjusted earnings per share of $0.58 cents and $1.01, respectively. Aerospace segment sales for the second quarter of fiscal 2024 were $498 million compared to $437 million, an increase of 14%. Commercial OEM and aftermarket sales were up 15% and 18%, respectively, driven by increased aircraft utilization as a result of continued growth in passenger traffic and price realization. Defense OEM sales were up 4%, and defense aftermarket sales were up 17%. Aerospace segment earnings for the second quarter of 2024 were $98 million, or 19.8% of segment sales, compared to $73 million, or 16.8% of segment sales. The increase in segment earnings was primarily a result of higher volume, and net price realization. Turning to industrial, industrial and segment sales for the second quarter of fiscal 2024 were a record $338 million compared to $281 million, an increase of 20%. We saw growth in transportation up 46%, and power generation increased 14%. These increases were partially offset by a 16% decrease in oil and gas. Sequentially, oil and gas sales were up 7%. The increase in transportation sales was primarily led by on-highway natural gas trucks in China, which totaled approximately $65 million in the second quarter, driven by significantly higher demand compared to the prior year quarter. Although we saw a significant increase year over year, China on highway sales were lower sequentially as expected. Given the market dynamics Chip mentioned, in Q3 we don't expect the same run rate that we've seen over the past several quarters. For the third quarter, we are expecting a range of 35 to $40 million of China on highway sales. As we move into the second half of our fiscal year, we expect industrial sales growth rates to moderate given the high comps in the back half of fiscal 2023. Industrial segment 
earnings for the second quarter of 2024 were $65 million, or 19.3% of segment sales, compared to $38 million, or 13.4% of segment sales. The increase in industrial earnings was a result of higher volume, largely due to the heightened demand for our China on highway business, net price realization, and operational improvements, including increased output and efficiency gains. Excluding the impact of the China on highway natural gas truck business, industrial segment margins were in line with the first quarter at approximately 14%. Non-segment expenses were $33 million for the second quarter of 2024, compared to $58 million. Adjusted non-segment expenses for the second quarter of 2024 were $29 million, compared to $23 million. At the Woodward level, R&D for the second quarter of 2024 was $36 million, or 4.4% of sales, compared to $38 million, or 5.3% of sales. SG&A for the second quarter of 2024 was $81 million, or 9.8% of sales, compared to $76 million, or 10.5% of sales. The effective tax rate was 19.1% for the second quarter of 2024, compared to 11.8%. The adjusted effective tax rate was 19.3% for the second quarter of 2024 compared to 17.8%. Looking at cash flows, net cash provided by operating activities for the first half of fiscal 2024 was $144 million compared to $40 million. Capital expenditures were $56 million for the first half of fiscal 2024 compared to $44 million. Free cash flow was $88 million for the first half of fiscal 2024, compared to negative $4 million. Adjusted free cash flow for the first half of fiscal 2024 was $90 million, compared to negative $1 million. The increase in free cash flow and adjusted free cash flow was primarily due to increased earnings partially offset by higher capital expenditures. Leverage was 1.2 times EBITDA at the end of the second quarter compared to 2.2 times EBITDA. $28 million was returned to stockholders in the form of dividends in the first half of fiscal 2024. Lastly, turning to our fiscal 2024 guidance. Based on visibility into the third quarter demand for the China on highway natural gas truck business and anticipated improved operational performance in the second half of fiscal 2024, we are raising certain aspects of our full year guidance. Total net sales for fiscal 2024 are now expected to be between $3.25 and $3.35 billion. For fiscal 2024, Aerospace sales growth is now expected to be 12 to 14 percent, and segment earnings are still expected to be 18 to 19 percent of sales. For fiscal 2024, we now expect industrial sales growth to be 13 to 15 percent, and segment earnings to be 17 to 18 percent of segment sales. At the Woodward level, the adjusted effective tax rate is now expected to be approximately 20%. We expect adjusted free cash flow to now be between $325 and $375 million. Capital expenditures are still expected to be approximately $100 million. Adjusted earnings per share is now expected to be between $5.70 and $6, based on approximately 62 million fully diluted weighted average shares outstanding. This concludes our comments on the business and results for the second quarter 2024. Operator, we are now ready to open the call to questions. Thank you. The question and answer session will begin at this time. 
If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up the handset before pressing any numbers. Should you have a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, press star 1 a second time. Your question will be taken in the order it is received, and please stand by for your first question. And your first question comes from David Strauss with Barclays. Your line is open. Thanks. Good afternoon. Afternoon, David. Um, your increased guidance on the um, on the aerospace side going from 10 to 14 now, 12 to 14. Is that what is that attributable to? Is it OE aftermarket? And could you Chip? Could you address where you currently sit in terms of max rates and uh, max rates and 787 rates? Yeah. So taking the second one first, because I think it's you know the really a relevant question that I think we might hear a couple different ways today. Um, as I've said before, we, we don't really um, clock our business to exactly the build rate that we're in very close connection with all of our customers that lead us to the max. So whether it's an engine supplier or um, another integrator, um, we are just responding to the exact signal that we get from those sources and um, we, we're in close contact with them and having discussions about the necessity for at some point the the amount of material flow to probably reduce. But as of now, you know, we haven't seen any strong signals that reduce the rates within the next quarter. Uh, we think that the, our fourth quarter and early 25 is when we would see um, adjustments potentially. And you saw Boeing said they're working sort of supplier by supplier to make sure that they've got clear to build and visibility to where they want to go. Um, so, you know, we think there's potential um, risk to having lower uh, max related volume in the fourth quarter, but that's built into um, the guidance that Bill shared. Okay. And, and the change in your guidance, and then um, I know it's only a slight change, but what, what's attributable to? And then a uh, quick follow-up on, on LEAP. Uh, LEAP, we're starting to see shop visits on LEAP. Are, are you seeing any aftermarket activity yet on your uh, LEAP business? Thanks very much. And maybe for Chip Hits LEAP, just on the tightening, it's, it's just based on what we've seen in the first half of, uh, for Aero, uh, and then tighten it up as, as we have a half, uh, a half a year left. So we just see tighter visibility uh, of that aerospace range. Um, OEM is, is continues to perform well. Uh, aftermarket is also uh, holding in. So, so that's really, uh, David, why we're, we're tightening it up uh, to 12 to 14. Yeah, I'd say just a little more confidence that the low end of the range is, is not going to be what we're going to see. We're going to see the middle to up, and that's why we, we tightened the, it up to 12 to 14 on the, on the range. Um, as far as LEAP, yes, we are seeing some uh, material flow, FMUs, some um, fuel pumps, things of that nature from the uh, from the LEAP uh, engine. Not a lot, obviously. Um, a lot of those early visits are more check and repair and, and specific item related. Um, but every once in a while, we do see a, a removal that we've had the opportunity to, to test our um, R&O shop layout and capability that we've uh, laid in place. Thanks very much. Thank you. And we will take our next question from Scott Duschel with Deutsche Bank. Your line is open. Hey, good afternoon. Afternoon, Scott. Hey, Scott. Hey, Bill, can you say what the price realizations were this quarter and how that splits between the segments? Yeah. Um, you, you know, Scott, we continue to see really great uh, price uh, activity to help us to offset our uh, inflation that we're seeing. Uh, it'll be around eight, just below 8% price realization at the company level. And I'll just say that each segment uh, contributed their fair share to that overall um, uh, outcome. Okay, thank you. Then, Chip, it looks like you ended the quarter with about $317 million of cash on the balance sheet, and you didn't buy back any stock this quarter. I guess the question is, is this a reflect change in your capital allocation priorities, or are you still planning on buying back more stock in the back half of the year? Yeah, it does not reflect a change, actually. A lot of 
timing and other decisions, uh, you know, in, in the mix there. Um, for the second half, though, I, I will say that we are raising the priority of the, the buyback in our capital allocation strategy. Um, de definitely want to offset dilution and, and make some progress on that and return some cash to the shareholders. Okay, thank you. And last question, Chip, is there anything you can say about your content on this power JDAM variant that Boeing is working on? Um, not at this time. Okay, thank you. Sure. And we will take our next question from Robert Springarn with Melius Research. Your line is open. Hey, good afternoon. Afternoon, Rob. Hey, Rob. So, so Chip, you know, often when a new CEO comes in, a new CFO, you implement a lean program or some other kind of operating system, it can take a while to bear fruit. You've had very good results so far. And so I wanted to ask you, you know, how how that's taking place and then maybe as a follow-up, in other words, why you're getting faster traction than some others do, but also, Bill, is there any way for you to parse out how much of the improvement in performance in margins is, is um, lean and execution as opposed to, obviously, price and volume? So I guess first question first, um, you know, Woodward has been on a lean journey for, you know, close to eight years or so. And um, it's taken different, it's had different chapters to it in terms of what the focus has been on. So um, when when I joined and, and brought a few other folks along with me, um, we're, we're building on that, that foundation that was here. So um, a lot of the language was in place, a lot of, a lot of understanding. Um, I'll just say that the, the, the challenge really hasn't been with what we started with from the seasoned, you know, veterans in the company. The challenge that we face is what everybody else faces, and it's the how many new how many new people are on the team. Um, so that's that's our challenge in our production facilities and our production system is getting um, you know the newer people acclimated, the newer newer frontline leaders acclimated, and expectations set. And you know it's just a it, it like you said it is a long process, and um, we've been able to stabilize some of our supply chain. We've been able to stabilize and then grow uh, output in in a number of our our plants. Um, we still have quite a bit of variation between plants performance in terms of on time delivery and and the productivity journey. So there's a lot more to do and there's a lot of upside over the next two to three years that we see based on really getting traction and and moving to the more advanced levels of um, increasing inventory turns and really getting more productive um, on the lines and in, in, in the flow of, of our products. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Rob, I, I think it's, it's going to be hard for me to split that out. Uh, for sure, though, we have uh, uh, the, the, the margin expansion uh, has benefited greatly from our, our focus on, on price, um, but also our operational excellence has in, allowed us to improve our output and we are getting a margin expansion because of our ability to deliver on that in the volume and getting that lever through. Um, I think on, on lean, uh, as, as Chip mentioned, we're uh, in the process, and I think that there's a lot more opportunities for, for that in the, in the coming years. But um, great execution and good price and volume flowing through has really contributed to our, our margin expansion. I know that people like to say lean is this never-ending journey, but based on what you both just said, is there a way, I think, Chip, you said two or three years, you know, to get, you know, all of this fairly mature? Is there a way to characterize what inning we are in with lean? I I think we're in the early innings, so it's, you know, okay. inning two or three here. Um, we've got a lot of, a lot of things to work with in terms of, our ability to improve and get more out of uh, our production system. Okay. And then just a, one more quick thing. Uh, Woodward's typically spent about 6% of sales on R&D, and you're a bit below that lately, 4% or low fours. Uh, longer term, what's the right, uh, you know, the appropriate amount to spend, and where are you focusing the R&D efforts? Thanks so much. 
Sure. You know, you, as you probably know, that these are long cycle businesses we're in, both the industrial and the aerospace. And when, you know, new products, new product opportunities come along for us to participate in, whether it's the launch of a new industrial engine or industrial gas turbine or a new airplane, our, our R&D expenditure goes up when one of those programs comes in because there's just so much involved in designing, developing, and testing and, and certifying those new products. Right, right now, we don't have a lot of that activity going on. We've got a few components here and there on missiles in space. We've got a few, um, you know, uh, uh, P to X uh, uh, new renewable fuel type of um, opportunities underway in industrial. Um, and then we've got this really large zero E um, Airbus um, uh, fuel cell demonstrator. So we've got a few of these more technology development and and smaller customer product uh, development going on. We don't have any really big uh, platforms uh, underway with the customer. So that's what's, al that's what's allowing some of the R&D to, to be a little bit lower. And quite frankly, our net engineering expenses are up. So we've deployed engineers to help with the production and productivity and what we're trying to do with lean. So I think it's, it's not as much about we're investing less in our products people in future. It's just taking some different color of money and putting it in different places right now where the needs are. Got it. Got, thank you. Sure. And we'll take our next question from Gavin Parsons with UBS. Your line is open. Thanks. Good afternoon. Hey, Gavin. Good afternoon. Uh, guys, on the industrial guidance revision, can you parse out how much of that was China truck versus non-China truck? Um. Yeah, I, I, I'll just say in general, uh, Gavin, it it, uh, it is as we talked about recognizing uh, that China on uh, on highway third quarter volume, uh, and and we we did see um, based on our non OH performance in the first half that we are expecting that uh, to to stay consistent throughout, uh, and the combination of those two is what led to us uh, increasing our um, industrial guide. Okay. I think non-OH might have had some mix or pull forward in the first quarter. Um, you know, is that, to your point, still going to be a sequentially stable margin in the back half? Yes. We, we believe that, uh, that that will be sequentially stable. Yeah. We're working with our customers, we, we that was our what we said we saw in the future based on customer input, but that that pull forward different mix first half for second half actually didn't materialize. So um, that's a piece of the uh, of the change to the guide as well. Okay, that's helpful. And then maybe just in, in China on highway going out to, to 2026, you know, the guide doesn't have much in there. Uh, is there a way to either you know expand the geographic base of that technology or, or maybe expand that technology into different engine types or in, any way to think about dampening the, the revenue unpredictability? We're, we're, we're really evaluating a lot of different ideas to, to dampen the revenue volatility, uh, Gavin. So um, we're, we're looking at different regions. We're looking at you know like how much how much we want to invest. How much how much do we want to have that be a part of our portfolio from a from that standpoint? Um, if we if we grow it, it might be more volatile. So I mean we're we're in the strategic planning phase, uh, looking at the next. Three years right now, and that team is, you know, actively bringing forth <clears throat> different scenarios or ways to uh, grow that business, but also to potentially, as you're saying, uh, make it less less volatile by 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 spreading the customer base, the regional base, and other 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 plays like that. So er early days on that. Um, you'll hear more from it later from us later on it. Okay, great. No, uh, no, it's a, a small but significant piece of the business, so I appreciate all the uh, the color. Thanks, guys. Indeed. Yep. And we'll take our next question from Louis Raffetto with Wolf Research. Your line is open. Hey, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, maybe just quickly, I know you, I think you said that uh, oil and gas is up seven percent sequentially. Do you have that for you know either end or both the other uh, businesses in the industrial?
so transportation is uh, flattish sequentially. If I'm looking at the right thing. You're right. Yep, you're right. And then uh, power generation is up, say, seven, eight percent, maybe high single digits. Right. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And then, you uh, you know, Bill, maybe just for, for you here, the was there anything in aerospace? It was, you know, great performance. Uh, so anything sort of, I'll say, one-time nature there, or just trying to sort of square what you did in the second quarter with sort of the, the guide for the rest of the year? It almost looks like margins are going to step down like 100 basis points. Is, is there any reason for that or conservatism? Yeah. Um, I, I think I, I'll pick up on your last word. Conservatism is, is definitely a, a thought that we have as we uh, look at the environment. Uh, uh, we're... We're, you know, first half uh, finishing up at um, uh, where Arrow is right around 18 and a half percent between the first quarter and the second quarter. Uh, so uh, that that implies for the second half, uh, you know, roughly the same amount that we saw uh, in in the first half. And so so there there were some uh, some good service sales, a little bit of good mix in the second quarter. But um, we think we'll, we'll continue to have a solid uh, aerospace margin rate come out there, and, um, and, and, and all that comes through. We'll, we'll be at the upper end of our, our 18 to 19 uh, guide, but we are also being mindful of uh, supply chain uh, as well as our, um, as, as our uh, OEM demand. demand yeah. All right, great. And just one quick one. Uh, Chip, I guess, is it fair to think that you still think OE will grow faster than aftermarket, or are we less certain today? Uh, we're, we're less certain today than we were, you know, our last call um, with the with the Boeing rates. So, um, you know, one, one way to think about it is when we developed this operating plan at the start of our fiscal year, we were thinking that third quarter would be higher OE volume and fourth quarter would be even higher yet. Um, from from an OE standpoint, and now we're we're thinking it's going to be a little bit bit softer, so the the mix will be better from a rate perspective, um, and we also we will be working on different margin expansion levers because we were sort of planning on a higher volume and better flow through and better amortization of our fixed costs for fourth quarter based on that OE, you know, and then just looking at all the different levers we have to work on on margins will prioritize some of the others that are not related to, uh, you know, the OE uh, volume increase and make sure we can deliver in that range. Great. Thank you very much. Welcome. We will take our next question from Pete Skibitsky with Alembic Global. Global, excuse me, your line is open. Hey, good afternoon, guys. Another another nice quarter. Hey, Pete, um, thanks. Hey, one more one more question on China. Um, I just wanted the way you guys are talking. It sounds like you'd be at least 185 million, maybe a little, maybe 195, 200 for this year. What you know? How would you suggest we all think about fiscal 25? What's reasonable in terms of everything you know today? Um, you know, directionally at least. You know, up, flat, down, a little, down a lot. What's the right way to think about that? Well. I don't know what the right way to think about that is, to be just completely candid. Um, you know, what, what we're doing is making sure that we're working on all the other parts of the industrial business to have 25 be a really good stepping stone towards our, you know, 2026 commitments that we put out there. Um, so we're we're working on every other part of the industrial business and making sure that we're ready to respond to the the, any demand we get from from China that can make that story, you know, better from a margin standpoint and serve that customer well. So that's how we're thinking about it. We kind of model it in there as as a as a very, you know, break even kind of level for us. Um, something that does no does no harm to our our plans. And we, like I keep kind of saying, is these two things that drive us to behave that way. One is. A, uh, a, a lack of visibility to a market dynamic that we can predict a trend for, and and really uh, uh, customer volatility that um, uh, can result in volume disappearing within a quarter. So th those two things, I, I believe, require us to 
to plan and act the way we're we're acting right now. If there's a change to either one of those, like we start getting a lot more visibility to real market dynamics, where we have longer term customer commitments from all of our customers in China that would allow us to have a firmer uh, view on what what a forecast turning into shipments would be, we would plan differently. But for now, that's our our approach. Okay, understood. I appreciate that. La last one for me, just on, uh, you know, pricing. The pricing is, has been pretty solid for you guys in, in this environment. And, you know, inflation doesn't seem to be going away, right? We're, we're in that kind of three, three and a half percent range. Is, is, is this an environment where, you know, you're going to continue to kind of press on, on pricing uh, until something meaningfully changes? I, I think we have to, Pete. We have to be mindful that um, until we see a signal of, of deflation going on in the in the general markets on commodities and, and even potentially labor, um, we've got to be mindful of the fact that these are long cycle businesses where commitments were made a long time ago, and we're we're you know happily stuck with our customers and we're happily stuck with our suppliers, but trying to make sure we don't get squeezed in the middle. We've got to be active on 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 price from the aftermarket standpoint and catalogs as well as when long-term agreements come up um, you know the opportunity to to negotiate a fair uh, price agreement okay that's great thank you yep and we will take our next question from Gautam Kama with TD Cowan your line is open yes hi uh, congrats on the numbers thanks thank Gautam you. Hey, I had a question on the OH business. Do you guys have a sense for the level of sales required to break even in that business in a given quarter? We 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 do have a good uh, a good sense of it, and um, uh, and and that sort of as we as Chip just mentioned, as we're looking out, uh, that's kind of how we plan the business at that roughly break even point. Um, you know, at, at the, the first half of last year where we where we didn't have much uh, OH, it was, you know, in that break even to a drag to kind of environment. Negative, yeah, it was negative. Uh, and so then as we started seeing it um, creep up, that's where we started to get uh, a, a lot more leverage and, and, and was able to get above that. But um, we do have a good sense of, of where that point is. Would you mind sharing that with us? And last year, first half, I have about forty million of estimated sales. Um, yeah, I, I, I can't, I can't give no. give you that, uh, but we do have a good idea, and, and we use those for planning purposes. Okay, and I'm just curious. Thus far, we're like a month into the quarter. <clears throat> is it consistent with that thirty-five to forty million dollar uh, rate in Q3 that you're expecting, or is, are you running above that? And expecting a slowdown later in the quarter. We're, we are uh, we, we are we are in line with what we got it in the thirty-five to forty range. Yep. Okay. And uh, just following up on an earlier question about leap aftermarket uh, thus far, I, I'm curious, given you know the, the OEM and CFM has a lot of service contracts attached to the leap. Are you seeing um, much in the way of, of aftermarket pricing opportunity uh, for those for those products that you're selling into the aftermarket right now, or are those going, I would imagine, more and more through the, the CFM service shops and therefore going out at the same price as an OE sale? I don't know if you have any, uh, any view on that. Yeah, that's not exactly how it works. So we, we price to the aftermarket to anybody who – uh, we work with we work with CFM shops. We've got you know agreements with other airline shops. We've got agreements with independent MRO facilities. So uh, you know whoever we we work with, there's an aftermarket um, uh, agreement for how we're going to do terms and conditions and price and turn times, et cetera. Last question for me was just on cost inflation on at industrial. Uh, was there much of a change sequentially in, uh, excuse me, in the March quarter relative to the December quarter, and 
do you expect much of a change in the second half of your fiscal year relative to what uh, you experienced in the second quarter? Um, yeah, there, there is. Um, um, we, we don't see any major uh, uh, changes beyond what we expect in, in inflation. Uh, we continue to drive uh, good price and productivity to continue to expand our margins and, and kind of yield um, the, the guidance uh, that we provided on the industrial business. Thank you, guys. You're welcome. We will take our next question from Tony Bancroft with Gabelli Funds. Your line is open. Thanks so much, uh, gentlemen. Great, great job in the quarter. Um, you know, Chip, you know, since, you. You've, since you've taken over, you've really done a fabulous job. Um, any any thoughts or changes to your thinking? I know we sort of talked about this in the past, but maybe an update on doing something transformational, either large acquisition or maybe more in the uh, it within or without outside your space or even financial engineering similar to, you know, some of your contemporaries like IE, GE, Crane that have, have done something like that. Just maybe just give us an update there and, and just your uh, thoughts if anything has changed. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so really, I, I think if you look back at our investor day presentation, um, almost everything that we're thinking about for the future of the company is, is represented there in terms of, you know, our desire to grow our industrial and aerospace businesses, have them be um, collaborative and synergistic, capture all the market act opportunities that we see in front of us uh, uh, with the aftermarket um, in aerospace and uh, the energy transition and the new fuels in um, industrial. We think that's plenty of opportunity to work with. Um, as far as M&A goes, we are always looking at uh, bolt-on or strategic ads that might help us achieve those goals that we shared uh, in Investor Day in an even more efficient and more impactful way, um, and that's kind of where our focus is. Great answer. Thank you so much, gents. You're welcome. And we will take our next question from Sheila Kegnogu with Jeffries. Your line is open. Thanks. Um, good afternoon. So I wanted to ask um, a few aerospace questions, uh, just given the performance was really good. Um, on commercial, starting with maybe price, how do you think about pricing within OE? You talked about the aftermarket. Um, when we look up 15% in OE and when we kind of look at the engine manufacturers, you know, leak shipments were flat, but revenues were up 30. Pratt was up 40 on shipments, but revenues were up 60. So can you talk about your shipment Delta versus total OE growth? So our, our, our shipments are up quite, quite a bit and we've in some cases added some scope. So that has also um, caused, you know, what little step functions inside our up, uptick of uh, revenue year over year. Um, the As far as pricing goes, you know, as you know, most of those contracts are, are Long term, very long term contracts. Um, you know, some are life of program, others are, you know, just decades. And uh, we are able to capture escalation um, to some extent. And so the pricing year over year um, can be quite substantial with indexes that, you know, have, have performed quite, um, have, have moved quite high in the high inflationary environment. So it's a combination of a little. Of, of shipping a little more number of part numbers, having the escalation um, clauses come in um, reasonably favorably, and then also um, having the the rate and demand go up from the manufacturer. So that, that's one of the things that we we can't see very well is where the inventory is is getting bound up in the system, whether it's ending up at the airframer in terms of built aircraft all the way in at the flight line delivery and, and waiting, or it's, uh, you know, at the airframer facility in terms of an engine, or it's sitting in the incoming inventory, uh, our part sitting in the incoming inventory of the engine manufacturers. So, you know, there's a lot of spring and damp in the system. And, uh, you know, demands may have been higher than the shipment that was being achieved by the engine manufacturer quite 
quite easily since they're trying to sort out, you know, all their different suppliers and they don't want to turn people on and off. Okay. Um, got it. That makes sense. Um, and then maybe on military aftermarket, really great performance up 30% for the first half. Um, what's driving that and how do you think about the exit rate out of the year? Is there more upside just given supplemental funding coming through as well? Yeah, just on, on the, the aftermarket, Sheila, um, this time last year, the first half of first half of last year, we were having some supply chain challenges, so uh, we saw some depressed numbers in the first half. Throughout the year, though, we saw that improvement uh, uh, come back, and uh, so so the comps are um, are a lot higher in the second half. So uh, uh, we see that our uh, we're about at the right uh, level. And uh, we expect that to sustain through the rest of the year. But again, those comps are going to get tougher because the supply chain did in improve last year. Okay. And working, yeah, and Sheila, and working on, on our opportunities there, I mean, there's some discussion earlier in the call about lean. We, we truly believe that's a, that's a growth area for us longer term. Um, as we get our turn times down, we can, we can go after more, more business. Uh, so we, we think there's opportunity there that we haven't captured yet. And last one on Arrow, is there one thing that, you know, is the most favorable mix within the sub-segments that you would call out? Most favorable mix? Yeah, in terms of um, margins, whether it's defense yeah. aftermarket or, you know, Arrow aftermarket. You know, the yeah. commercial Arrow aftermarket is what I'd say is our our <clears throat> our place where we can um, Get the best returns, and the the situation with deliveries not increasing, where when the demand is so strong for travel, is resulting in the legacy fleet flying longer and harder um, than we forecast. So one of the the good things that's different from when we put together this operating plan is we were thinking that uh, we would be coming off of the peak of things like B2500 fuel controls and CFM56-5 HMUs, that these these sorts of uh, um, fuel control overhauls would, would be less and less and that we would have seen the peak already. But with the current situation, we believe that peak may extend um, quite a bit. And that's one of the things we've factored into the second half um, is, is that not going down. Great. Great answers. Thanks, Chip. Welcome. And we will take our next question from Michael Chiarmole with Truist Securities. Your line is open. Hey, uh, good evening, guys. Nice results. Thanks for uh, taking the question here. Um, Thanks, Mike. Maybe, uh, 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 Chip, just to stay on um, kind of Sheila's questioning and you talked about that aftermarket, um, up pretty strong um, on a uh, on a sequential basis, um, on a year over year basis. Was there anything? And I know that the, the second quarter tends to be seasonally strong for you, but anything to call out? I mean, was it more provisioning or or any different color there um, aside from you know these OE challenges? Anything driving that particular strength? Yeah, there was some provisioning uh, in the in the quarter. So, um, and that is like you said, it's seasonal plus some provisioning, and then not not dropping off on the um, you know the legacy fleets, and having a, having a little bit of leap come through, and a little bit of GTF fuel nozzles come through. These sorts of things, um, you know, all happening a little, you know, contributing a little bit to making it it better, both sequentially and year over year. Okay. Okay. Got it. And then just maybe all the way back to, to build rates. I, I know you kind of said it's a little bit of a moving target, but but GE taking down their lead production for this year, I guess, you know, round numbers, maybe it's like 160 engines at the midpoint. I mean, were you shipping to them based on that original plan? Do you have line of sight to see if they have excess inventory? I mean, I know, obviously, we got the aftermarket mix and the demand there, um, but but any any color on, on how you're building to, to GE's revised plans? We're, we're talking to them continually, as you might imagine. Um, the, 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 the feedback is that we're, we're on plan with them. 
and to stay tuned. And so we're we're staying tuned and we're you know telling you that there's a range of things to expect for the the second half and some of it depends on just you know how much schedules get pushed out in fourth quarter. Uh we think third quarter is pretty well kind of baked because it's you don't make sudden moves in the supply chain uh uh, unless you're China on highway, um, <laughs> note to self. But uh, you know, we're we're looking at fourth quarter, our fourth quarter, and saying you know there's probably some some movement to expect there, and and that's why we're um, focused on the other levers that we have to make sure we can cover anything that gets pushed out. Got it, got it. Just last one, you just brought up the, the China again. I mean, is it, it, sort of the business, you know, maybe maybe not at these levels, but, but can you underwrite this this sort of work and these, um, you know, opportunities in perpetuity? I mean, is there an oper- uh, or a potential outcome where they bring work in-house, they go something homegrown? I guess just trying to figure out how confident you guys are in your, your position there over the long term with your customers. Yeah, it's always a it's always a risk in our business that an OEM who is very strong, very well funded, and very well um, supported by a, a deep engineering team can decide to insource the the fuel system. Um, we're in strategic discussions with our customers about long term collaboration, and you know, use the term underwriting. We want to we want to underwrite any any investment we might make with improved you know future terms and conditions and commitments so you know we're we're talking to various customers about how to how to dampen the volatility and if we're going to invest in the next series of 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 fuel systems we want to have more assurances that we'll not only get a return but be able to to plan better so we're we're working on it i don't know how it'll turn out but you know it's not for the lack of uh of engagement and, and willingness to to talk about it and collaborate with our customers. Got it. Fair. Thanks, guys. Welcome. <clears throat> now we'll take our next question from Noah Poponik with Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Hey, good evening, everybody. Hey, Noah. Hello, Noah. Have you ever modeled out how large the leap becomes as a percentage of the total company earnings whenever that aftermarket stream become you know hits hits something close to steady state well the the leap plus gtf is a pretty pretty impressive aftermarket stream in our in our models um you know we are talking about quite a few years because in the in our 2026 27 type of horizon we're, we're still not seeing a a huge contribution that, that that's more like a 28 to to early 30s uh, as far as when it really um, those come home if you will uh, for the repair and overhaul um, one thing I'll tell you is we're planning to grow the rest of the company um, alongside that so um, I'm, I'm not ringing any panic bells about concentration um, because we're we've got a lot of other irons in the fire and a lot of other business to grow by the time we're talking about late 20s, early 30s. Okay, that makes sense. Um, The aerospace increment, the aerospace, if I look at the aerospace margin from the perspective of an incremental margin, um, you know, in the first quarter, you're in the mid 30s, but it was a pretty easy compare. Second quarter was a lot tougher compare, but the incremental went up into the 40s. Didn't sound like anything super abnormal in there, maybe a little bit of mix. I guess the the back half the guidance implies you kind of drop back down in the low to mid 30s, and then the you know from there to the 22 outlook is 30. Um, I'm sorry, the, the two year forward outlook is 30. I guess is do you have a framework for the right kind of sustained drop through in the aerospace business? And I know you know right now there's kind of you're getting both price and cost above very long run normal, but just trying to get a better sense for what's possible from you on these aerospace incrementals moving forward here. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll let Bill answer the the rest of this question, but I mean, it is a, it is a mix. It, it is a mix, very important about what the mix is when you calculate that that flow through. So, you know, our our mix um, sequential mix 
got more uh, aftermarket in it uh, by 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 a little bit. So that can that can turn the wick up a little bit on the on the flow through, Bill. Yeah, I, in in general, Noah, we 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 feel like that business uh, ought to deliver a thirty to thirty five percent incremental. Uh, and, um, and and so that's kind of how we look at it. And like Chip said, depending on where we are, uh, that can be higher. Uh, but over the long term, we think about it between 30 35. Okay, great. Chip, what you were just talking about in looking at strategic changes to how you sell China on highway and um, things of that nature, what, what would that actually look like? Would, would, are you talking about minimum buys? in short windows of time, or, or how could that actually manifest? Well, you know, we don't, we don't have anything to, to, to say um, that's, that's firm or, uh, you know, negotiated this time. Um, we would just like to get more information uh, on the market. We'd like to understand uh, more about build rates. We'd like to protect our ourselves in terms of when we've got inventory flowing uh, from a lead time perspective. Um, but as of now, the agreements that we have or the agreements that we have with the customers, we've got to, you know, come up with a, a good value proposition reason to um, decrease our risk and increase theirs uh, from, from their, the customer standpoint. Um, and there's, you know, multiple folks to work with uh, in China and, you know, the system might be useful for other regions in Asia as well. So we're we're looking to see what we can do on that front. Okay. And then just last, the, the in the near term, is it correct that you guided 3Q kind of on highway to 30 to 40 million revenue? And did you say anything about the fourth quarter sizing? Uh, 35 to 40 for the third quarter, uh, NOAA, and uh, for fourth quarter, uh, again, just minimal amounts uh, at this point. And that, we'll Bill, update. is that minimal? We'll it just you're only going to guide one quarter at a time, or is that what the orders are telling you? The, uh, the correct. Uh, based on our visibility and our um, our, uh, our our feeling comfortable about that, it's it's kind of three quarters out, which uh, it is more than what we had sort of at the beginning of uh, of our sorry the second half last year. Uh, we did get a little more visibility, and, and that's what we have to work with for now. Okay, great, thank you. And we will take a follow up question from David Strauss with Barclays. Your line is open. Great. Uh, thanks for taking the follow-up. Um, at this time, has anything changed with regard to um, what you laid out in terms of your forecast for 2026, either you know aerospace or industrial end markets, or you know overall revenue, free cash flow, any anything that has changed at this point in terms of how you're thinking about? No, we're just uh, working on the path to that answer for 2026, and we feel like we're on track quarter by quarter so far and no, no changes. Okay, and um, your data center backup uh, power for, for data centers, how, how big is that business today, Chip, and what, what are you actually seeing there? Are you, are you seeing demand signals or are you actually seeing it, it manifest itself in the numbers yet? So over the past couple of years, that's, that's grown, and I, I think we're just gonna keep that in the power generation. Uh, uh, call out, um, but it's it's grown inside that, and we have multiple OEMs that are that are competitive in the data center um, space for standby power. Um, you know, Caterpillar and MTU are both very um, well known in that space, and there are some other Asian um, OEMs coming into the space as well um, because there's quite quite a lot of demand. And so we're seeing the signal, but we're also seeing the data centers get built and the big long rows of reciprocating engines and um, day tanks for diesel fuel get put in. Okay, thanks very much. Welcome. And Mr. Blankenship, we have no further questions at this time, so I will now turn the conference back over to you for closing remarks.
I'd just like to thank everybody for joining the call, and we'll talk to you again next quarter. And ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our conference call today. If you would like to listen to a replay of this conference call, it will be available today at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time by dialing 1-800-770-2030 for a U.S. call or 1-609-800-9909 for a non-U.S. call and by entering the access code 2819144. A rebroadcast will also be available at the company's website, www.woodward.com, for 14 days.